know, but it's been that way for 50 years. Well, they said it's a They said they were going to find it. They're the ones that passed out the... Uh, Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's St. Charles County. Good evening, everyone. Hey, that's the first time I've got to use that thing since I've been chair. How about that? Very good, Ed. Say again. Is the mic on? Can you hear me? Yep. Kind of have a built-in one. God gave me a mic, so I'm glad you can all hear. So welcome to tonight's St. Charles County Council meeting. We have a full house tonight. So I'm glad that you are all here. We will start with our invocation. It is from Pastor Bart Hildreth. He is from the First United Methodist Church of St. Charles. Afterwards, we will have our Pledge of Allegiance done by Councilman John White. If you would stand and remove your caps, please. Pastor. May we be one together in prayer. Holy and wonderful God, whose love and passion is for the whole world, Teach us to see every question of policy and law in the light of your greater love. Bind us most of all to the people whose need is most acute, for the poor and homeless, the sick and elderly, for those who go to bed at night not feeling safe and those whose days are spent in far too much fear. Grant us a greater imagination to use the resources in our little corner of this county in ways that temper justice with mercy, and the humility that knows we all have need somehow, some way. As we deal tonight with the gritty details of governing, we lift to you all those persons in our community who are on the front lines of trying to make a difference. The police, the men and women of the fire department, those on the city council, board members and city leadership, we ask that you give us all a discerning wisdom, the courage of a clear moral compass, the urgency of anything short of the full truth, and a willingness to reach across differences to find common ground and new understanding. Now with hearts full of gratitude for the many good things that come with living here, we join in celebrating the accomplishments of Mod Z, of our children and youth, and ask that you bless them, even as you bless us all, with a great place in which to grow our families and grow old. In your holy and powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Thank you. you. May be seated. Call the roll. Councilmember Joe Cronin. Here. Councilmember Joe Brazel. Here. Councilmember Dave Hammond. Here. Councilmember Mike Elam. Here. Councilmember Terry Hollander. Here. Councilmember Mike Klinghammer. Uh, here. Councilmember John White. Here. Uh, I would ask Councilman Hammond for his motion. Yes, I'd like to uh, make a motion to move resolution number 1703 as the next order of business tonight. A second. Have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? So we will move forward with resolution 1703, and I would ask um, Ryan Treasurer if you would meet me at the podium. Resolution 17-03, sponsored by Council as a whole. A resolution recognizing and honoring Modulation Z, Mod Z, on its achievement as one of the top drumline groups in the world. Whereas the St. Charles County Council is pleased to recognize and honor the achievements of local high school groups who have accomplished extraordinary feats, 
And whereas Mod Z is a winter drumline group consisting of students from Fort Zumwalt North, South, and East High Schools, and was created in 2013 so the students could participate in this fun and exciting experience, and whereas in April, Mod Z won the WGI World Championships Percussion Independent Class A Gold Medal Performance Performing What's Out There, finishing at the top of their class with a record-breaking score of 96.025 points. On their way to their World Championship, Mod Z beat out 35 teams, consisting of more than 36,000 individual participants from throughout the United States, Canada, and Europe. And whereas in the short time that the group has been competing in the World Circuit, Mod Z has won numerous competitions, including the gold medal for the PIA class at the MCGGA Circuit Championships in 2014, 2016, and 2017. And whereas Mod Z has accomplished all of these amazing feats under the direction of Ryan Treasure. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the County Council of St. Charles County, Missouri, as follows. Section 1, the St. Charles County Council hereby recognizes and honors Mod Z for winning their world championship. Excellent. So we'd like to ask, um, Ryan Treasure is the director, just talk a little bit about the competition, kind of how you got to this point. Um, we took a, a big group photo outside earlier because oh, okay. we were figuring, trying to get everybody into this picture. It was really hard. So uh, we've got a lot of different heights in this group. So you want to talk a little bit about sure. the competition? Uh, well, the competition is starts, we started rehearsing for it in October, and it ends in April. Um, we have about half the kids here. There's like 41 kids. We're all high school kids. And in our class, we're the youngest group because we're the only all high school age group. Most of the kids are in their 20s. So when we win a thing, we're beating out kids that are five, six years older. Our, our average age is 16 and a half. Most of the other groups are 20 or 21. Wow. So um, a lot of universities and stuff like that. Um, this year, when we went, uh, we not only won the gold medal and you know set the score the 96.025 that's a record for that class we're the first group from the state of missouri to win any class in the 40 years of wgi history so wow. the entire world circuit we're the first group. And that says it's under my direction but there's uh, other people to help, like Rob Gatewood's, uh, you know, the assistant director, Chad Shadler, John Steinberg, uh, Josh Link. We have people helping us. Uh, Nick Bregman, I'll forget somebody. And then the parents are there all the time. They're doing, they're there. We have 500 hours that we meet outside of school that they, they take out of their time over spring break, over Christmas break. They're showing up and we're doing, you know, we're working. And the kids, well, they complain, but I mean, <laughs> but not, not as much as you'd think, but, in, uh, but yeah, the parents are there doing that stuff too. They're helping with props. They're like, Hey, we need food for this. And, and it's just, it's a big come together community thing. Everyone going for the same goal. And, and then this year we, we achieved it. So in five years we have gone from, uh, you know, Hey, the, what is this to, to, to winning the thing. So I'm very proud of them. They're, they're a good group of kids. So outstanding. Congratulations. Thanks. Let's take a quick look. Mr. Chair, yes, Mr. Sir. Chair, next time though, would you bring your drums because we can use a lot of live music in this part. Okay, all right, all right. Thanks. All right, good. Mr. Chairman, um, yes, ma'am. For the parents who are here trying to film that, the the meetings available on YouTube usually about 24 hours after you all are gone. So at sccmo.org, you can go on there and you can watch the entire meeting 
uh, on demand. So in case you wonder what you missed when you leave, you've got that if you stay for more than the first 11 minutes of the meeting. So we appreciate that. Any other comments? I need to vote, uh, read it and call a vote. Oh, my bad, sure. yes. <laughs> a resolution recognizing and honoring Modulation Z, Mod Z, on its achievement as one of the top drumline groups in the world. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Klinghammer? Yes. And Councilmember White? Yes. Thank you guys very much. We will move on to public presentations. Ms. Hope Woodson from the Public Health Department will kick us off tonight. Right. For those of you who are looking for premium seating, it just opened up up front. <laughs> tough to tell a drum corps to be quiet, you know, it just doesn't work. All right, Hope, we'll start with you. Are we waiting for your presentation to show up on the screen? I am. Okay, we'll call an alternate and we'll go with Vicki and she gets to go first while we get all that stuff done. Vicki's got an update on the 2017 legislative session that ended in a bang. Yeah. What it an did. exciting last day of session. It, it was pretty wild. It was. Yeah. Um, thank you for having me here to give a, a quick little um, overview of some of the highlights and lowlights. Um, good evening, Chairman Elam, Elam and members of the council. Um, if nothing else, this year's um, session had considerable drama from start to finish. A week-long special session ended on Friday, authorizing the Public Service Commission to set a special electric rate for smelting, uh, metal smelting, steel fabricating, or other large electric users if it's determined that a facility would not otherwise be able to operate and that setting such a rate would be in the interest of Missouri citizens. That had a, an emergency clause. So if the governor chooses to sign that, it will go into effect right away. Um, during the regular session, about half as many bills passed as you would normally expect. A few passed early on and the governor signed those. Um, those early passage bills included the TNC bill, which allowed Uber and similar companies to operate throughout the state, and also the right to work bill was passed early. Other bills that passed included allowing port authorities to expand or reduce advanced industrial manufacturing zones within their area. Of note is that the funds appropriated for grants to assist port authorities was reduced this year, but they did come away with $4 million. They lost $2 million of that appropriation in a separate bill that just didn't make it through all the way. Senate Bill 283 made county road management changes that were pushed by rural um, counties. We secured the option of passing an ordinance to protect our ability to promptly address dangerous conditions on our county roads. Senate Bill 62 dealt with financing government pensions for counties enrolled in a plan other than loggers. Our work there was to ensure that our residents would not be charged a fee to fund government pensions for other counties. So we took care of that. <laughs> Permission was given only for St. Louis County and St. Louis City to use an existing authority in state statutes to pass a one-eighth cent sales tax to support the St. Louis Zoo. All counties were prohibited from using a second um, sales tax authority for that purpose. 
The zoo's main campus now under this um, bill is required to remain free of charge, but residents of counties that do not have a tax supporting the zoo can be charged admission to other facilities, programs, and events. The bill included, though, taxpayer protections for any new voter-approved sales tax for all counties and cities that use certain state-approved um, authority to do that. Those protections that affected counties, including requiring a new sales tax to be limited to a use for a stated purpose, prohibiting submission of a sales tax proposal to voters within two years of having submitted a previous proposal, and also limiting the combined sales tax rate under that authority to just 1%. And St. Charles County is well beneath that, that level. Missouri residents also were given the option to obtain a federal government compliant driver's license called a real ID, so that will be coming in time. Political subdivisions now cannot require a minimum wage that exceeds the requirements of state law. Project labor agreements for public construction projects was banned. Can't do that anymore. Enhanced penalties were set for crimes targeting law enforcement officers. So we want to try to keep them, them safe. Several measures identified as pro-business passed, and that included tort reform and modifications to discrimination and workers' compensation laws aimed at reducing frivolous claims and inflated damage awards. Many issues were left on the table. House Bill 656 failed, and with good reason. This is the bill with the goal to provide the deployment of the next generation of high-speed wireless service known as 5G, and it was fraught with problems from the start. Major concerns of the county included granting largely unfettered access to the county's right-of-way to an ever-expanding number of entities, also granting authority for the placement of equipment onto local government's signage, traffic signals, and buildings, also obstructing our ability to responsibly manage the right-of-way and provide for the public safety. The statewide prescription drug monitoring program failed. Senate changes were unacceptable to House members, and those included reducing the specific drugs that would be monitoring, purging data every 180 days, and preempting more robust local programs, such as the one that's being implemented here. One of the law enforcement measures that failed would have a curtailed the county's ability to work with federal law enforcement agencies against high-level crime in the region. So we were very pleased to see that that one did fail. Um, the 9-1 funding effort that's been going on for a while, it failed again in the Senate. Um, we work on that every year to ensure that the county's interests are protected should the bill um, get, get through one day. The state budget has its own drama, and it started with a significant budget deficit that they had to overcome, and legislators were working into the last day of session to find creative ways to protect and increase funding. Um, the state's payment toward the assessor's costs of property reassessment and also the correction department's housing of state prisoners awaiting trial both came in at last year's rates, so we didn't experience a decline there. And funding for local public health also remained flat for the coming fiscal year. If I've missed any items that you all have particular interest in, let me know, and I'll get that information to you. Yes? Mr. Crum? I have a... Um uh, a situation in my district where there's a state road and a city that wants to reduce the, the speed limit on that state road to Letter Highway because of the um, uh, high incident of accidents at Highway P in O'Fallon at Main Street. Would SB 283 enable that at all? No. That bill, the particulars of that bill, dealt with um, some specific type of issues that cause a dangerous situation on roads. And largely what the rural counties were trying to address were drainage issues. So in some areas of states, you have farmers with the way they are um, putting in their crops or trying to divert water in other areas to keep their property either dry or watered, I'm not sure. But um, it was causing causing a lot of problems with, with some of the roads there. And the state had a very strict um, 
provision in state law that actually would have allowed a property owner that did that and caused that dangerous situation to be charged with a misdemeanor. And in talking with our legal um, counsel and also with the highway department, that was always a very effective statute because that's a serious condition. And um, they were always able to get those property owners to react quickly and work with the county to get that that corrected. Um, so the legislation that passed kind of upended that. But as I said, we work to get a provision in there that we can go ahead and deal with that situation um, with an ordinance here. So if that bill gets signed into law, I'm sure we'll have some language that we would submit to you all. But yeah, it wouldn't deal with that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Does Senate Bill 182 uh, bans uh, project labor agreements for public construction projects. What is it? What is that? Do you um, know what, kind, it, what they meant yeah, by are that? The, is, is this the one I was talking about where they, they banned those uh, public, uh, the project labor agreements? Yeah, I don't think that we had those. If my, Never. yeah, we have not done that. But um, some communities around the state would, and they would require um, agreements with um, the local union labor and things um, in doing those projects, and so they would require that. The St. Charles County never did. Um, we monitored that bill just to make sure nothing got put in there that would somehow cause us a problem. But um, the bill went ahead and passed on its own um, without our involvement, certainly. But Senator um, Under, one of our state senators, was the lead on that bill. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you, Vicki. Okay. Appreciate you think that. If something update. later, let me know. So I understand our technical issues have been worked out? Yes. I think the solution Or we are on the final stages of working them out at this moment? Yes. I think the technical issue may have been me. I um, sent it to you all at the end of the day on Friday, but forgot to send it to um, communication so that they could put it up on the board for you. So my apologies. We're all good. So it was appropriate that Vicki was talking about the uh, PDMP, and that is what Hope is going to talk about. He said, hopefully. I think Hope's open. <laughs> hey, Trevor, if you've got access to it back there, will you go ahead and try and pull it? It's taking a minute to try and load the jump drive. Oh, you don't want this one? Okay. Hey, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to give you an update on the prescription drug monitoring program. So just briefly, as we've talked about over the last year, the overall goals of the program is to basically provide our physicians and pharmacies with a tool. It's a tool so our pharmacists and physicians can be better describers, prescribers and better dispensers and um, for health departments like ourselves to draw down data that can be beneficial in recovery programs, health education programs, and so forth. It is not a tool to be used to police somebody. It is simply a tool for us to be smarter healthcare operators. And this visual just kind of gives you an idea of um, how this all works. You have a prescri prescriber who writes the prescription, you have a dispenser that fills it, and in the PMP aware, they can look at that information exchange so that when a dispenser, before it hands that prescription over, can look to see if that particular person has filled that prescription, possibly at multiple different locations within the week or within the day, or if the prescriber, before he writes that prescription, can see if that person has been to several other ph physicians prior to coming to them. This is the timeline that you're looking at of the program. So starting back in January of um, this year, 
we started our first communication with our dispensers, trying to prepare them to become enrolled in the program. And as we've progressed, we are now all the way at the bottom, you will see we've been through the first go live. And what that means, and I'll show you a slide here in a minute, of the number of counties who went live in April of this year. And really all go live means is that that particular county has data flowing into the system. So for example, we passed our ordinance back in September of 2016. So we started live in April, but it retroactively goes back to when we passed our ordinance. So all the data of prescribers and dispensers goes back to September of last year up into present date. Now we're waiting for our second live, which is um, July 1st, and that will be the second set of counties that I'll show you um, will be enrolled in the program and ready to go. So phase one, as you can see, those are all the different counties that went live when we went live. Phase two is the next set of counties that are contracting and ready to go and signing their agreements and will begin submitting data on, in July. There will be a third go live for those that are just um, coming into the program. As many of you may have read, uh, Jefferson County just recently passed their own ordinance as a health department. And so they too will have the opportunity to go live in August. And we'll just keep going until we get more and more counties. This is a visual of just to show you all the different counties that have contracted with St. Louis County to roll out this program. And, and actually, if you look at the materials that that came out last Friday, you'll see there's actually two tones that don't really show up there very well. So the dark ones, as I remember, Hope, are the ones that actually were in the first go live. And the, the ones that you, it's really difficult with that wall to see shading are the second go live group. So we'll get a better depiction of that on any future updates. And keep in mind that this information, um, what I'm presenting to you tonight is information we had as of May 25th. I can tell you daily that we get hundreds of new prescribers and there's a lot of new counties in the process of looking at new ordinances. So up-to-date information, is, it's new every single day. So this data that I'm showing you is all the contracting counties that are currently submitting data. So far there's 2,700 requests to become enrolled in the program as far as a dispenser or a physician. There's 2,300 approved users. All this means is that there's 400 as of the 25th that are kind of in limbo. There's a pretty lengthy process for you to be approved to be into the system. And so it kind of just takes its time. So by this presentation right now, those 400 could already be in the system. There's 80 to 100 new registrations per day by registered users. So again, it's a very um, fast-paced moving system and the information changes on a regular basis. Right now, we're averaging 627 patient searches per day, which is phenomenal, I think. So that means that before um, somebody is being prescribed something, there's 627 average patient lookups per day before they're handing over that prescription. There's 14,000 controlled substance dis dispensations per weekday, which basically means a prescription's being handed out and that's being monitored. PMP interconnect is fully executed, and what that is, is that's information being across state lines. Right now, they're working with our neighbors that are closest to us and surrounding the state of Missouri, but once they get those in place, they'll keep expanding out to all states that have PDMP programs, which is every single one of them. So eventually, when a pharmacist pulls that up, they'll be able to see that information across state lines, which is the more data flowing into the system by more states, by more counties, the more useful that it is. And the Technical Advisory Committee has been formed, which is great. That is a, a, consists of three physicians, two pharmacists, um, our PDMP coordinator, as well as three other surrounding counties, and then some Technical Advisory um, PDMP um, individuals who also sit on that. They're responsible for looking at thresholds, rolling out um, you know, how one is registered, um, just any questions that may pop up. They're, they're the go-to group for the region. 
And as I stated, we have hired our PDMP coordinator, and I have brought her here tonight. This is Jessica Burkmeyer. She is our epidemiologist slash PDMP coordinator, and she is the know-all for our county. She is the person who sits on the TAC, and she's responsible for contacting all of our physicians, all of our pharmacists, touching base with them. And I can tell you, since we've had her on board, our enrollment has um, skyrocketed. I think they were really happy to see somebody from St. Charles County reaching out to them and being a part of this. The information below is St. Charles County data. So to date, and ag again, this is going back just a few days, we have 151 pharmacy or the pharmacy delegates enrolled in the program. We have 50 physicians. We have one physician assistant, nine nurse practitioners, nine dentists, and one local law enforcement. And keep in mind, the local law enforcement, they can register, but they can't see anything. They can only request information if they have an active case and they have to produce the subpoena number. And this website is located on the St. Louis County Health website. And this is all the information that you need to know about PDMP and where we are today. The timelines, the frequently asked questions, there's video tutorials that show dispensers how to enroll in the program. There's all the counties that you can, prob you can see a little bit more detail about their actual ordinances, when they were passed, which ones are in progress, and just any questions that you may have about what we're doing. And it's updated on a daily basis. And that's the end. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. I saw that like you had 600 prescriptions went through the system out of 14,000, and you've got like 50 doctors. How long do you anticipate it's going to be till you got full coverage on all those prescriptions are, are checked and all the doctors in this county are on the system? I have been pleasantly surprised at how fast it's been progressing. Um, we kind of went through this slow period where I thought we're not going to hit our target dates. Um, but what I can see now is the ordinances are passing faster and faster. As one county passes, another one passes, and the go-live dates are coming quicker and quicker. So the last one was April, and then we have July, and now they're looking at August and then possibly September. So with each new month as we progress, um, that just means it's open for more registrants to, to apply for the program. So I personally hope by you know, a good seven to eight months of data exchange that we will have a, a pretty robust, healthy system to pull from. So, so how many doctors are in the county now? There's, well, doctors Pardon. and pharmacists, there's 800 available users in St. Charles County. Okay. So we're about at 221 right now. So you, you got a ways to go then? We got a ways to go, but just and is there is hard. there any mandatory, uh, do, they, do, they have to, do they have to be part of the system by a certain date? Physicians do not have to use the program if they mm -hmm. choose not to. Pharmacies have to give a, a really good reason as to why. It could be a technical reason, and then they will work towards amending whatever that technical reason is. Yeah. How, many, what, how many pharmacies are in the county? Uh, pharmacies, I think we have 290 plus. And how many of those do you have signed up in the system? You said about, we have 151. So you're about halfway through the pharmacy system. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of work. Thank you. Welcome. Any, other, Any questions? other questions, comments? All right, thank you thank very, you very much. much. So we will move on to public comments. Um, public comments are listed, are limited to three minutes each. You'll hear a timer that will go off when your three minutes has expired, and we'll ask you to wrap up your comments and move on to the next speaker. Our first speaker tonight, Carol, is? Would be Ron Laris. Hi, guys. Hey, Joel, Mike, and the rest of you that I know. Hey, guys, um, Yeah, as you probably all know, that I'm, I live down in Lake St. Louis, city limits, and in, in, on Dwella Road. I got a horse farm there. So I'm in an unincorporated area of St. Charles County. So now you, what, you, what you're proposing here, this is uh, having to do with the build, building codes that you're proposing there. And uh, I, I just got a couple questions here. Is it, and, and I don't know if they've been thought out, but I'm sure there'll be other people to ask you questions on this, Mike. But, you know, we have in the county, we have unincorporated areas that have HOAs in them, in the housing and so forth. You know, and what's gonna overrule what area? Because there'll be some kind of conflict goes in there. I thought I want you to think about that, okay? And here's another thing, is it, you got, what, 700 pages I heard or something like that? 8,000, okay. 
So there's 8,000 pages of code, okay? Can, can I get, see a show of hands? How many of you guys read all that code? You're not gonna say you said it, you read it. Okay, good. We got one out of the, all the it. Here's the, here's the thing, guys. We, we passed the Obamacare without people reading that. People need to know what they're passing to be able to put that forward. So I know it got voted down once, I know it back up there. So I just want you to think about that because that's an important issue here. If you're passing code that affects the people, you need to be able to know what's getting, what you're putting there. Taking some code from some international standards or wherever they're coming from and passing them just because some other city did or, you know, not a good idea. You guys really need to know why you're doing that. Okay, so that's another point. Uh, so let me, let me see. see, I wrote these down so you guys really, and I want you to think about too. When you pass codes, then you, you could have a retrofit requirement. In other words, codes go into effect and then some area in the housing areas, and it affects housing when they're building houses, and then when you're selling your house, could be re retrofit back into the housing, houses that we have there, depending on the code and how that's handled through you guys. So that could be a cost into people's houses and the cost of putting houses into, that, into the area of St. Charles County. So that's an important thing that you need to understand how you're affecting that. Um, and in this bill, this code, since it affects uh, so many 8,000 pages of what it is, thanks for correcting me on that, the 8,000 pa pages, it's like, you know, we all need to be basically, we should be voting on that. That affects a whole lot of area in the county. I know you've been given the rights to vote on county council, but maybe it should be taken up for the vote of the people, you know? Yeah, let's see, I got one more thing, I think, here. Uh, anyway, I don't, I, got, I don't know if I left one out here, but I'm sure there'll be some other people talking about it, too. But I just want to put that up, guys. My Thank three you, minutes Rob. are up. That's good. That's but think about time. that, guys. And I, I want to make the, the drum line. Good job, guys. Right. Thank you. Our next speaker, yeah. Carol. And this one is also against. It's Kathleen Lenahan. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Kathy Lenahan, and I'm from the St. Peter's area. If you build this way, you will save money. Guaranteed? I don't think so. The last meeting I was at, gentlemen sat there and said that we would get lower homeowners insurance by passing these building codes. Many insurance companies factor varying information into the formulas that they use to come up with homeowner insurance premiums, such as the age of the home and the type of roof. And while a better ISO rating could, could lead to a premium reduction, changes in the home's replacement costs or blemishes on the homeowner's credit history could offset that. ISO's Public Protection Classification Program, PPC, plays an important role in the underwriting process at insurance companies. Of course, the PPC information is just one of the parts of the decision-making process. And communities that improve their PPC may, may is the operative word, get lower premiums. The thinking behind using ISO ratings is this. The better equipped a community is to fight fires, the less likely it is that homes and businesses in your area will sustain a major fire damage. Some calculations are out of control of the average homeowner and the construction of a residential or commercial structure may have limiting impact. For example, roughly 50% of the score looks at the local fire departments including staffing, training, ge geographical distribution of firehouses, and adequacy of fire equipment. Approximately 40% of the score takes into account the community's water supply, including the placement and condition of fire hydrants and the amount of water that's available to put out fires. 10% of the score measures the efficiency of emergency communications, such as the 911 system and the number of emergency dispatchers. Other areas to consider would be, instead, increasing training for fire department personnel, improving fire education, more fire prevention activities, better equipment for the firefighters, improving the municipal water system to accommodate more fire hydrants in remote areas of the county. Instead of promising the citizens of St. Charles County to blindly accept that if we endure restrictive and oppressive building codes, that we would get lower premiums would be unreasonable. We have heard these types of promises before. Why not let the community be part of the system 
to come up with a responsible plan to save lives, not just for your terms, but for the future of the entire county. If the county truly wants to focus on saving homeowners insurance premiums by improving the ISO rating, perhaps you should focus on those things that would better serve the entire county, better fire protection through improved county-owned assets. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker. Um, number three, Brenda Webb, and that's also against. Okay, good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for listening to the citizens. We appreciate it. Um, get my cheaters on here. Um, I am here tonight to speak also against uh, Bill 4475. Um, and I would just say that we are, most of us here, and there's a large group of people here that are opposed to adopting these or upgrading. Um, and uh, we're not opposed to codes altogether. You know, we, there are good reasons to have codes for certain things or, you know, that, that fit St. Charles County. Our objection is the massive, you know, broad reach that these things have. They, they address everything. Um, they address thing, typhoons, you know, in, in Japan. They address earthquakes in wherever. Um, and we, we would just like to have codes that are written in St. Charles County for St. Charles County that are owned by St. Charles County. One of our objections is that you have, in order to own or get a copy that you can possess, a resident can, can possess, you have to buy it from ICC. You know, I, I just think that's abhorrent that we have to buy the codes. We understand that there's a copy at the county. I work in St. Louis County. So I could take my lunch hour and fly over here and try to grab a book and re speed read through it, which I don't speed read. <laughs> um, and, and still I can't make a copy because it's against the law. ICC has the copyright and they say right on their website it is to help fund what they do. That's why they do that. So I object to that. I think that the, we should have codes that St. Charles County wrote or, you know, from somewhere that we can get a copy that can be loaded on the website that the citizens can just download and have a copy. And the reason we need a copy is because of the fine that we also all hugely object to, that we could be fined up to $1,000 and or a year in jail I, we're ju I'm just, I don't know why I'm still shocked at government, but I find that shocking that our government thinks that that's appropriate. And, um, you know, and it's per incident, so is it every time the inspector comes by? Is it daily that that can go up? In 10 days, can it be $10,000 and 10 years in jail? I mean, come on, you guys. You know, it's, it's just, I don't know, I'm just shocked that that's in our law. Um, we really want that taken out. Uh, yeah, the cost of the books mm -hmm. are like over a thousand dollars for the whole set. If you want the 15 books of the whole set, it's over a thousand dollars. That's unconscionable. Even one book is 35 up to over a hundred dollars a book. So depending on which one we need, and we need to know so that we know whether we're in compliance or not, you know, or we might go to jail. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's just it's just really extreme. We we don't want extreme codes. We want common sense codes. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. We have three more speakers against. Okay. Okay. Marsha Bear. Thank you, sirs, for letting us speak this evening. My name is Marsha Bear. I live in Augusta, the southwestern rural portion of the county. We have 38 acres. We are unincorporated. Yet, we, if you pass these, we are signed on to all of those 8,000 pages of codes affecting everything in our life. I have asked the council repeatedly, how did we go from BOCA codes to the international code? I didn't have an answer from anyone. So I did a little research online, and I'll point that out to you and be happy to give you all of the web links. In 1976, the United Nations Habitat Conference on Human Settlements was held in Vancouver. Quote, above all, governments must have the political will to evolve and implement 
innovative and adequate urban and rural land policies as a cornerstone of their efforts to improve the quality of life in human settlements, unquote. 1983, the United Nations World Commission on Environment and Development held in Norway. They were tasked with formulating, quote, a global agenda for change, unquote. They defined sustainable development. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. 1992, United Nations Conference on the Environment and Development held in Brazil. President George H.W. Bush signed that document and brought it into the United States government. That 350-page document, never ratified by Congress, quote, addresses the pressing problems of today and also aims at preparing the world for challenges of the next century. Its successful implementation is first and foremost the responsibility of governments, unquote. 1993, President Bill Clinton signed Executive Order 12852, creating the President's Council on Sustainable Development, thereby, thereby codifying sustainable development into our government. He contracted with the American Planning Association to publish Growing Smart Legislative Guidebook, Model Statutes for Planning and the Management of Change. The ICC, the International Code Council, was created in 1994, one year later. These are model statutes for change. They are not the complete document. Thank you. They leave a place for us to put our jurisdiction. I ask you not to adopt them. Appreciate your time. Next speaker. Richard Nation. I don't really have too much more to offer. They've covered a lot of stuff. Um, you know, one of the things that I do remember hearing about uh, was you guys were making a committee that was going to kind of go over a bunch of these things, root out the bad stuff and um, or the unnecessary stuff. I don't know did that if that happened or not. And um, the way, eight thousand pages is a lot of stuff to go through. Uh, only one of you raised your hand about going through the whole thing. Um, and uh, I think the one gentleman made a good point. Uh, something of this magnitude, uh, I would suspect, should be voted on uh, by the citizens. Um, it's a, I don't know, to me it's a pretty big deal. Uh, so, thanks. Thank you. We have one more. Bill Davis. <laughs> Bill. Hi there, I'm Bill Davis. I live about a half a mile back that way. It costs $30,000 for a building permit for a rectangular 40,000 square foot building on a rectangular lot. That's 75 cents a square foot. It's more money than it costs to insulate the building. I own the building, $30,000. I had $3,000 a year to the rent to recoup my $30,000. People buying goods out of that store, the, Pay the three thousand dollars to consumer. Moving on, it costs fifty thousand dollars for the permitting process, site plan, building plans, soil tests, meetings, grunting and groaning, all that. It so now we're up to eighty thousand dollars. Consumers paying eight thousand dollars more for products coming out of that building, and doing it for 15, 15 years. Then. The maintenance aspect of this thing, and I haven't read the document. I don't really need to. I can just imagine what's in it. Talking about maintenance, 
And how does the maintenance go? Well, you got a code enforcement officer driving around a little white truck, right? He sees some trash in an apartment lawn. He goes back, sends a registered letter to the landlord, the guy that owns it, saying, you got six days to pick up your trash or we're going to fine you $500 a day. Now, he could take a little twig or something, poke in the trash and find out a phone bill or something that says Sue Carroll Apartment A going <laughs> on Sue Carroll's door and say, pick up your trash. And you say, why don't you do that? Two reasons. Number one, there are more renters than landlords. Number two, the landlord is shackled to the building. He can't get away. He can't do anything. He's just got to pay the $500, pick up the trash himself, and so forth. Here again, it raises the consumer's cost. He has to raise the rent on everybody to put up with Sue Carroll. And if you try to evict Sue Carroll sometime, if she's missing a foot or something, you're in deep trouble. You can't possibly do it. And this is Sue Carroll's problem. Now, in 40 years of building buildings, never once did anybody come from St. Louis or St. Louis County and say, hey, Bill, I've got to have a new building. My building does not meet code. Never once. It's, they busted my wife's windshield out of her car. She won't come to the office and help me. They broke in, stole $5,000 worth of machine tools, and on and on and on. Always theft, always vandalism. And this, I'm sure what you're talking about tonight does not address that problem at all. So anyway, I come up with a name for your bill. I want to read this to make sure I got it right. It's Government Financial Intercourse with the Consumers Bill. <laughs> okay, any questions? Hearing none, thank you for sharing this little speck of time and space. Thank you, sir. Your time is expired. We actually have something on we a different have, topic. We do what? On Bill 4480, Ed Barrio. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I just wanted to uh, speak for the um, rule. Uh, Amending section 405.060 for the Rural Recreational Activity Center. I, uh, my wife Tammy and I have owned a pumpkin patch for 14 years out in Forestell, Missouri. Uh, hopefully maybe you've driven by it or would like to drive by it sometime. Absolutely beautiful piece of property. We're constantly uh, getting compliments on how well we keep it up. Um, Recently, uh, I used to do it more of a hobby and a little extra income. Uh, recently, I lost my job, so it's now a full-time job for me now. Um, the, pa the passing of uh, this bill would allow me to expand my business to do all sorts of other activities. Um, I'm currently working under a conditional use permit for my pumpkin patch. This would allow me to expand it to do other things. There's a huge demand for these type of activities in the county, and right now people are taking our tax money and going across the uh, border into uh, Lincoln County and Warren County where they're already allowed to do this stuff. Um, it would be much appreciated, and it would help me make a living by doing this if it was uh, considered for passing and I'd like to know if any of you have any questions on it. Thank you very much. When we get to that part of the bill, if we have any questions, yeah. we'll call you up. Great, thank you. Thank you for your time. We have any other public comments? That wraps us up. We are all wrapped up in public comments. We'll move on to oral report from the county executive. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Jeff Smith has an announcement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the council, uh, on your desk, I think you have some information there that uh, we're going to start distributing Thursday. Just wanted to announce that as of this Thursday, coming Thursday, June the 1st, uh, at about 8 a.m., uh, text to 911 will now be available in St. Charles County. Uh, it's been a long, long process. Uh, we've been working on it since uh, moving on to the new system, the new next generation 911 system, and this is the next phase of it is text to 911. Obviously, we'll always want to talk to a 911 caller if at all possible, uh, but we realize that sometimes that's not possible or the most practical way for someone to reach 911, especially if uh, they don't want someone to know that they're needing to call 911, domestic violence situation, uh, God forbid, you know, some type of school or business active shooter situation where they're trying to hide from someone. So anyway, it's coming. Um, 
be active uh, Thursday morning. Uh, you have the information that we're going to start distributing throughout the county. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Mr. Crowder. Um, I talked to Tom Near about this quite a few different times. This was something for him, and he was told me it was very important and realized that in times of nat natural uh, disaster, like Joplin tornado, you couldn't get through on the phones to 911, but you could text to 911. That is correct. So I think that's important that the public realizes that, God forbid, we have those type of disasters here, but should we do, the text might go through where nothing else will go through. So I, I hope that you can publicize that as well. Yes, that is a good point. Yeah. Yeah, I know questions? you've been working on this a long time. It's, it's something we certainly need. And, uh, um, you know, yeah. sometimes I wonder if there's a, another way to talk to my kids other than texting. So I, <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, exactly. It is the wave in the future. Like I said, we've been working a long time. I'm going to point him out, Drew Garrett here. He was our project manager from IS, uh, so he's been very helpful. Uh, unfortunately, like I said, it has taken a little longer than we'd hoped to, to get it active, but, but we've, we've finally reached the goal. So. Any other questions or comments? Good job. Thank you. Good job. Excellent. Thank you very much. Nice work, young man. Thank you. So we'll move on to, I'm sorry, County Executive, any further? No, sir. That's it. So we'll move on to consent agenda. Any items to be removed from the consent agenda? Mr. Chairman. Oh, go ahead. Oh. I'm sorry. Mr. Cronin has something I believe he wants to remove. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to entertain removing the last item on the consent agenda regarding, um, I'm sorry, uh, re regarding uh, I'm sorry, I uh, lost it here a second. Port I'm sorry, last item, roads and traffic, Port Authority feasibility study for discussion. Uh, we have a motion made and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All Aye. those opposed? No. 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 So motion carries, so it will be removed from the consent agenda. Mr. Cronin, it is yours. I, 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 oh. I too. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, my, I, my bad. I'd like to remove uh, roads and traffic change order. We have a motion to so I'll second that. We have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Well, <coughs> any other items to be removed? All right. So motion to, in favor of the remaining portion of the consent agenda. Motion made and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. So consent agenda is approved except for these two that we have pulled off. We'll start with Port Authority and Mr. Cronin. Uh, I read through this pretty thoroughly and did some research on it too. I've got several issues, I guess, starting with the cost. This pretty much just pays for a, a gold-plated study, and we budgeted $20,000 for this in the county's annual budget, and this came in at $98,000. Part of that $98,000, $15,000 is for their, their attorneys to draft a, um, a, an ordinance for the county council to pass, and I learned from being a good study of Mr. Hazelwood that the county council are supposed to draft all ordinances in this county. So that's one portion I have with it. The biggest issue I have with this thing is, is this Port Authority, if you look at the other ones that are uh, in this area, particularly in St. Louis County, this is an appointed body that doesn't answer to a legislative body like the county council. They're not elected. Uh, they have extreme amount of authority and power. But reality is that they are appointed, and the current plans are appointed by the executive, and once they get rolling, we don't have any control over them. That being said, what I fear the most is not this does this, this isn't just about ports. This is an economic development tool. This is the, the boundaries of this district will be the entire county boundaries according to the document. So they can, they can do this anywhere. In fact, in, in reality, most of the port authorities don't just build ports. They do redevelopment and economic development and projects like, um, like uh, recreational mixed use facilities, all types of stuff all over the state. My issue is that we're giving those, those appointed people the power to use eminent domain, the powers to create TIFs, and a lot of powers that we're going to have no oversight on. So I understand that there can be some benefits over TIF, uh, for TIFs. I understand that there's some benefits for port authorities, but I'm not free. I'm not uh, in favor of giving a port authority carte blanche over eminent domain in this county, over um, uh, property acquisitions, over TIF use, etc. I think we need to redefine print of this a lot um, more thoroughly before we jump into this thing. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Right. Start with Mr. Yeah. Hollander. Well, I, I believe this, this, what's on the agenda here, is just a feasibility study. I think all the things that you've brought up 
are all valid questions that will come before us, uh, you know, again, if this feasibility, once this feasibility study is done and we have the information that we need to make a decision. So, uh, I, you know, I think your questions are very valid. I think they're gonna be answered, you know, down the road. We'll start here and go to Mr. Brazel after today. Uh, <clears throat> I know we've been talking about this for a year and a half. It's, I don't think it's anything new. And, and until we actually have a study and look at this, uh, I don't know how we, we can move forward, but I'm, I'm supportive of at, at least looking at what opportunities this creates for the county. If it's jobs, uh, if there was actual, actual port built in this county that would, uh, improve the economy and add many jobs. That's something I definitely want to take a look at, but without looking at a study first, uh, um, I, don't, I don't think we can make a good decision. So I, I am su supportive of uh, the study. Mr. Brazel. I'd like to say I agree with what Mr. Cronin said. However, I understand the purpose of doing this. We, we tried to put a ferry in uh, uh, down the Missouri River to cross over Labadee, and um, it would, um, make it easier to get over Franklin County. And that's in my district gonna enhance tourism and some other things. And uh, without having the Port Authority, we have a lot of problems with that. And then we tried to do, do a marina down in St. Charles, which was gonna be with capital money with uh, uh, investors. And uh, they worked on that for years. And, and it was a great plan, a great concept, but the, um, the Army Corps of Engineers wouldn't let us do it because we didn't have a Port Authority. So there's other reasons why we're doing this, but I agree with what he's saying. I am supportive of doing the study, but I will not be in support of any kind of a board put together by, um, you know, the, the board should be the elected officials. It, that's the way I see it because we have to answer to the general public. So if, it, if we continue, if we go through this, we have to study it, get it figured out, but on the setup of it, it should be managed by elected officials who have to answer to the voters. That's how I see it. And so, and I, I never, the TIF thing and stuff, I, I know what he's saying, but again, that's not the intent of it either. Right. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, from a, I agree with what the other council members have said, and, and, and Joe, you're, you're right, we need to make sure that we don't give carte blanche authority to outside influences. We, we certainly don't want to do that. And I don't believe that the study alone would, would lead us to that conclusion. Um, one thing that you did point out, and I, and I congratulate you on, on uh, finding the 15,000, um, so I'll direct the question to, to Keith at this point. Um, do you need that that uh, um, that kind of assistance in their their study, or do you have the, the capabilities within yours to, to draft their own ordinance? I, I think the answer is we could probably, I've not seen the end result that you get from this firm, Goldstein and Price is their name. Uh, so, I'd have to say to you, I would hope that we'd have the capability to do that. But the other thing you've got to remember, we had a port authority in St. Charles County from roughly 1975 until 1998. We actually, unfortunately, we don't have any real experience in the real world with this sort of thing. Uh, there are a couple aspects to that then. Goldstein and Price, well known fine reputation for maritime law. It makes perfect sense they would be associated with the drafting of port authorities and their uh, documents that create them and so forth. So you would get the benefit of uh, their experience. And I think it is especially important, uh, the, the body of law that deals with things that happen on the water is called maritime law. Probably everybody in the listening audience knows that. These folks are specialists in that world. We, we are not. We might, we might well be able to structure a governmental entity to do this, but we might not know all the principles that we need to know to be, to, to be taken care of. I'm satisfied that we, we would have you and your department to review to make sure that we're not including any of the of the things that that Mr. Um, Cronin has warned us about as far as some of the um, potential problems that, that other communities have faced. Mr. Greifs, I just wanted to clarify that on the pricing schedule that you see, you see the 15,750 under bullet item number one. That dollar amount does not equate to the drafting of 
the ordinance. What we've tried to establish in the pay schedule was that we have a breakdown of the hours of service that we're receiving, but we also wanted to break it down the schedule into the deliverables so that there be established milestones. And we found that there's gonna be three basic middles that the consultant would provide us. One will be at the time that an ordinance would be drafted. So the 15,000 includes the work up to that point, which may include several meetings with our uh, city stakeholders, our partners, a uh, review of other port authorities. So it's not just the drafting, but that's the milestone of that middle. And that 15,000 is the work that leads us up to that point. At that point, there's a decision that we have of, are we gonna move forward or not? If we move forward, the next bite will be the middle of the application to the Missouri Highway and Transportation Commission. That next bite takes us up to another $49,000 <laughs> worth of work. If that gets approved, the next bite is delivering the final <coughs> report and that milestone was 33. So the clarity is that it wasn't 15 just for them to draft a two page ordinance. It's a milestone of work based upon the submittals, and the submittals that would be decision points to the council. Thanks for that clarification. Yes, Mr. Cronin. One last thing I'd like to clarify is this is, a, this is from March 12th Post Dispatch. It says low profile power. It talks about port authorities. Very few have anything to do with ports. This isn't about the idea of making a nice river port or stuff. This is giving the port authority the power to do the dirty work of eminent domain abuse in this county. And that is a big problem I have, representing a lot of people and a business that, that almost lost their power, that lost their land to eminent domain abuse. That's why I have a problem. We have a, right now an executive that's, that's been against, adamantly against the abuse of TIFs for quite a few years. We create a port authority and we get a different executive that doesn't have Mr. Elman's strong convictions about the misuse of TIFs. We were opening the door for a lot more TIFs in this county and that scares the bejesus out of me. I don't know how else to say it. So if we're going to do this and we're going to do a model, a model ordinance, I think somebody needs to give the direction is, I do not think eminent domain should be the venue of appointed board in this county. It should be the business of this council and the elected body of this county. And that's, that's, that's how I feel about it. Okay? I agree with you. Anybody else who want to weigh in on this? I would point out that, as Vicki talked about, um, the Missouri budget had $6 million in for ports um, that you could apply for your share of up to $6 million in funding that the state of Missouri gets. That's your taxpayer money that they took to fund that budget. If you don't have a port authority, and there are 14 in the state, but if you don't have a port authority, you have zero opportunity to recoup a dime of that money. So at least having a port authority gives you the opportunity to go after a share of that money to try and recoup some of it. There's a lot of different things that you can do with that, but what I would suggest is let's do the study. When we get the study back, let's do a work session, bring in trans systems who are doing the study for us. Let's let them answer all the questions that you have. Let's talk about uh, the scope of the Port Authority, what you want to go for and what you don't want to go for. But my request would be to do the study to start. And then once we get the results back, we'll see from there. Yes, sir. Uh, with that, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. second. Motion to approve and a second. All those in favor, aye. 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 All those opposed? Opposed. Motion carries. Question? Very well. Move on to Mr. Brazel's issue. Yeah, I guess this is John. Is this your uh, deal here, the traffic green light thing? Yes. Why, why do you have, why is there so many extra work orders on this? Um, you're at over 20, 250000 on a $1.5 million contract. It seems like, is this poor engineering or why, I mean, and who, all these different things, A, B, C, you know, during construction, various additional work was required to make connections throughout the county for some field changes. How come that wasn't identified during the uh, engineering? Like all these different line items, it's like, how do we know who knows that any of this work is actually getting done? And I mean, who, who's watching this? All right. So I do apologize. There are quite a few change orders specifically to this contract um, and phase two of the project. 
The largest portion of that was a constructive directive and change order number six. That was 130,000 of the 200,000 number that you mentioned. That construction directive basically established and said, on our fiber optic network, there's various tubes of fiber. In order to have consistency throughout the county for multiple uses, we went ahead and modified the whole system so that the orange tube, let's say, was for gateway green light use solely. The brown tube across the county would be for municipal use. And so that required quite a bit more splicing and work on the fiber optic network to provide that consistency across the network as this fiber network grew. So if you go into a signal cabinet, you always know I'm working on the orange tube because I'm on the GGL network. This last change order number 12 for 39,000, that basically gets down to uh, the cost of getting into various city halls and retrofitting uh, municipal fiber components that, I mean, in all honesty, their data was poor. Uh, they did not have good ad spelts in. Uh, you see in this change order, we itemize out, there's work to get into uh, the city of Lake St. Louis, there's work to get into Darden Prairie, some of these smaller communities that just did not have good records of where some of their IT stuff was that we had to tie into as part of the program. But if we paid an engineer to do all that work for us, <clears throat> I mean, just like the brown and yellow wire that you just talked about, if we hire a professional to do all this engineering, why are we responsible for all the mistakes? So in this particular contract, um, we had two choices that we could have made early on in the process. One was to uh, do that very thorough upfront engineering and try to nail down every last thing and when you go through remodeling the system. Or we could have got to the point where we got pretty darn close, knowing that we're going to have some change orders. And we looked at the cost of both directions. It seemed at that time to make more sense that we were never going to get 100% of the answers from the municipalities because they just didn't have the data. They wouldn't let us into those closed closets, their IT closets. And so that's why you're seeing, like, like I said, this, this last one of some of these minor quantity changes that you know, add up to about $39,000. Any other questions? Mr. Cronin. It would be nice, John, if they could, if, if the folks, I'm sorry, it'd be nice if the contractor for this could coordinate a little bit better with other construction in the area. Right now, you got a down, you got a one two punch in, in Main Street of O'Fallon. In the south end, you got everything tore up for the water mains. North end tore up everything with Greatway Green Light. So, I mean, I don't know who, who planned that going on at the same time, but it's created one hell of a mess in downtown O'Fallon right now. It'd been nice if they could have got one project done for the other because the gateway green light people are hitting gas lines the water people are hitting gas lines the breaking water mains it's a it's a mess i mean having two projects at once like that so any i guess that's going to continue on all summer in downtown O'Fallon. you think well the gateway green light at least in O'Fallon, is, is coming to a conclusion uh they got the conduit in place which is the is the hardest piece of the project um but yes i mean we're in a busy construction season I mean, you look at we're in the leading edge of road construction much much more extensive road construction beyond GGL like, occurring throughout the county. Uh, the other thing I do want to point out is that the Gateway Green Light Project, just a reminder everybody, is a 80-20 project. It's 80% federal money, 20% county. Not that that makes you know, much difference, but I do want to keep that in mind that um, that is a, a federal grant project. Any other questions or comments? I'd entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Motion made and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Opposed. Motion carries. That wraps up the items from consent agenda. We move on to bills for final passage, starting with Bill 4468. Bill number 4468, an ordinance amending the zoning district map of the County of St. Charles, Missouri by rezoning land from A, Agricultural District, to R1B, Single Family Residential District, as per application RZ17-04. Any questions or comments? Seeing none. 
an ordinance amending the zoning district map in the County of St. Charles, Missouri by rezoning land from A, agricultural district to R1B, single family residential <coughs> district as per application RZ17-04. Council Member Brazel? Yes. Council Member Hammond? Yes. Council Member Elam? Yes. Council Member Hollander? Yes. Council Member Klinghammer? Council Member White? Yes. Council Member Cronin? Yes. Bill number 4468 passes. Move on to bill 4469. Bill number 4469, an ordinance amending the zoning district map of the County of St. Charles, Missouri by rezoning land from A, agricultural district to RR, single family residential district as per application RZ 17-03. Any questions or comments about bill 4469? Seeing none. An ordinance amending the zoning district map of the County of St. Charles, Missouri by rezoning land from A, agricultural district to RR, single family residential district as per application RZ 17-03. Council Member Hammond? Yes. Council Member Elam? Yes. Council Member Hollander? Yes. Council Member Klinghammer? Council Member White? Yes. Council Member Cronin? Yes. Council Member Brazel? Yes. Bill number 4469 passes on to bill number 4470. Bill number 4470, an ordinance granting conditional use permit CUP 17-03 to allow the applicant to increase the height of an existing 107 foot monopole style communications tower to 160 feet and to allow a 160 foot tall tower to be set back 107 feet from the nearest agricultural or residential district to Randy L. Schott, Janet M. Schott, and Stanley T. Schott, revocable inter vivos trust, property owners, and selective solutions LLC applicant. Any questions or comments? Mr. Cronin. Uh, this is in my district and I'm familiar with the site. I actually drove there yesterday afternoon and there were 14 people that wrote, uh, signed letters of opposition to this um, project. Um, most of the concerns of those residents have been taken care of. There's really only two properties you'll be able to see this additional um, atop of the tower and it's long ways away in their backyard. So I think the applicant has done a good job um, trying to take care of a lot of the issues the neighbors have brought up and um, I'm fine with this passing and moving forward now. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none. An ordinance granting conditional use permits CUP 17-03 to allow the applicant to increase the height of an existing 107-foot monopole style communications tower to 160 feet and to allow a 160-foot tall tower to be set back 170 feet from the nearest agricultural or residential district to Randy L. Schott, Janet M. Schott, and Stanley T. Schott Revocable Inter Vivos Trust, Property Owners, and Selective Solutions LLC applicant. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Klinghammer? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Bill number 4470 passes. We'll move on to bill 4471. Bill number 4471, an ordinance amending the zoning district map of the County of St. Charles, Missouri by rezoning land from C2 General Commercial District to RR Single Family Residential District as by application RZ17-05. Any questions or comments? Seeing none. An ordinance amending the zoning district map of the County of St. Charles, Missouri by rezoning land from C2 General Commercial District to RR Single Family Residential District as per application RZ17-05. Councilmember Hollander? Uh, yes. Councilmember Klinghammer? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Bill number 4471 Michael, passes. Michael, we'll move on Michael, to... Michael. I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda to go back to Bill 4468 because I made a uh, I made a mistake on that. Is that right, Keith? You want to move to reconsider? Want, I'm going to move to reconsider. Motion to reconsider on Bill 4468. Yeah, all, all those. In. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed. Go back to Bill 4468. I, I was, I'm sorry, I was reading something else, and this is, this is, we talked about this at the last meeting. This is where they want to put an apartment, or uh, this was turned down by planning and zoning. Um, um, You're right. And the staff turned it down. There's a, where, where's, um, is this Jared, or, or who's on this, Robert? This has a lot of problems, and a lot of people were upset about it, and I, I, I missed that. So I, I, I want to reconsider. I appreciate you bringing it back to up. Uh, I, I missed it also. I, I, yeah. Thank you. 
Do you guys want to, Robert, you want Robert to recap? Or do you remember this one we talked about? Robert, do you want to do the thumbnail on this one? Now that you say that, I remember that. Yeah. Weldon Springs Gardens edition uh, was platted before zoning and before um, subdivision regulations were enacted in the county. This is about an acre and a half lot. And if the rezoning went through, it would allow 20,000 square foot lots, meaning that this lot could get probably about two more um, lots out of this, this lot. A concern is if the zoning passes, it's really um, unclear and I don't believe that um, the, a subdivision plat could be um, approved without a variance because it doesn't have the flood free access. There's a bridge on Circle Drive that's about two doors down. This lot itself is above the flood zone but in order to get to this lot, um, either way you go on Circle Drive, you have to cross a creek and a bridge that will flood uh, periodically, go underwater. And there's a provision in the subdivision ordinance that says basically not to create new subdivisions in areas that don't have flood-free access. And so there's a concern of the Planning Zoning Commission and, and county staff con concurs with that concern. Plus, it's a large lot subdivision, and they want to put small lots in it. That's the other thing. That's All the other lots were three to five acres or larger, correct? Mm. Correct. Yeah. There was another concern expressed at the Planning Zoning Commission meeting that would be out of character with the lot sizes in the right. subdivision. So I, I'm going to, I don't know, how do you, do you recall a vote? or Carol, can we re-vote on 4468? You did a motion to reconsider. We did. So now the bill is under reconsideration, so you... You need to reread read the bill and revote it. Okay. No, I'm sorry, for, Mr. Cronin. Just for clarification, planning and zoning voted to deny this. Staff say and deny it as well. That's correct. 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 And, and I was w waiting for the guidance of Councilman Brazel on this. <laughs> this okay. I, I said the last meeting I was in opposition to it, but I guess. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, I think Mr. Klinghammer spoke also because he serves on planning and zoning, and he spoke that planning and zoning denied it, and we went over all the same rules that Robert did. I think that's a, that's just a myth. This, so this one slipped through the cracks. Uh, yeah, a holiday weekend. I'm claiming. So there we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you'd reread, so we can Absolutely. reconsider. Absolutely. Bill number 4468, an ordinance amending the zoning district map of the County of St. Charles, Missouri, by rezoning land from A agricultural district to R1B single family residential <coughs> district, as per application RZ 17-04. Councilmember Cronin. Yes. Councilmember. No, Brazel. I'm sorry. No. Yeah, no for me. Yep. So Councilmember Cronin was no. Councilmember Brazel? No. Councilmember Hammond? No. Councilmember Elam? No. Councilmember Hollander? No. Councilmember Klinghammer? No. Councilmember White? No. So 4468 fails. That's a great example of we can admit our mistakes, but we fixed it before we get out of the room. Right. Yeah. That's better than fixing it after we get out of the room. There we go. All right. So back on track. Bill number 4472. Bill number 4472, an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute intergovernmental agreements with special districts that provide sanitary sewer service within St. Charles County in order to authorize those special districts to inspect for compliance with applicable codes, repaired lateral sanitary sewer service lines in unincorporated St. Charles County when those repairs are funded in whole or in part by annual fees levied and imposed by those special districts to fund such repairs. Any questions or comments on this bill? Seeing none. An ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute intergovernmental <clears throat> agreements with special districts that provide sanitary sewer service within St. Charles County in order to authorize those special districts to inspect for compliance with applicable codes, repair lateral sanitary sewer lines in unincorporated St. Charles County when those repairs are funded in whole or in part by annual fees levied and imposed by those special districts to fund such repairs. Councilmember Klinghammer. Yes. Councilmember White. Yes. Councilmember Cronin. Yes. Councilmember Brazel. Yes. Councilmember Hammond. Yes. Councilmember yes. Elam. Yes. Councilmember Hollander. Yes. Bill number 4472 passes. On to bill number 4473. An ordinance. Uh, Bill number 4473, an ordinance amending ordinance 99-85, granting conditional use permit number C525 for a telecommunications tower in excess of 100 <coughs> feet to William J. and Tracy D. Wooten, property owners, and selective solutions applicant. Entertain a motion. 
Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to make a motion to uh, replace Bill 4473 with an amended Bill 4473. Substitute Bill 4473. Second. We have motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Substitute Bill 4473 is on the floor. Any questions or comments? Seeing none. Substitute Bill Number 4473, an ordinance amending Ordinance 99-85, granting conditional use permit number C525 for a telecommunications tower in excess of 100 feet to William J. and Tracy D. Wooten, property owners, and Crown Castle applicant. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Klinghammer? Yes. Bill number 40, substitute bill 4473 passes on to bill number 4474. Bill number 4474, an ordinance authorizing the county executive or his designee to execute a grant agreement and funding approval with the State Emergency Management Agency for a grant from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, to fund 100% of the projected total cost of acquiring and demolishing two residential structures, sustaining severe and repetitive loss in flood hazard zone of unincorporated St. Charles County. Any questions or comments on 4474? <clears throat> Seeing none. An ordinance authorizing the county executive or his designee to execute a grant agreement and funding approval with the State Emergency Management Agency for a grant from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, to fund 100% of the projected total cost of acquiring and demolishing two residential structures sustaining severe and repetitive loss in flood hazard zones of unincorporated St. Charles County. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Klinghammer? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Bill number 4474 passes on to bill number 4475. Bill number 4475, an ordinance amending chapter 500 building codes and county building commission ordinances of St. Charles County, Missouri, OSCCMO by adopting with amendments the 2015 International Building Code, the 2015 International Residential Code for one and two family dwellings, 2015 International Existing Building Code, 2015 International Mechanical Code, 2015 International Fuel Gas Code, 2014 National Fire Protection Association, 70 National Electric Code, 2015 International Plumbing Code, 2015 International Private Sewage Disposal Code, 2015 International Energy Conservation Code, 2015 International Fire Code, 2015 International Swimming Pool and Spa Code, respectively. Mr. Chairman. We'll start with Mr. Klinghammer and make our way around. I'd like to make a motion to, to, uh, hold, to, to hold Bill 4475. We have a motion to hold. Can we have a conversation See, first about some of the items, about the amendments? Very well. Yeah. Mr. Hammond first, then Mr. Brazel. Well, first of all, I saw some people roll, roll their eyes when I raised my hand. <clears throat> I've dedicated my entire career to building safety. <clears throat> and the building codes that we are adopting Many of them are the same that we've had for years. The only thing we're adopting are some changes that have made, been made in the last three years since the, the last code was printed. So this is a cycle that goes on since the codes were first, first brought into this country. I don't know, George Washington wrote the first building code in this country. Most people don't know that. Uh, his building code was you couldn't build your uh, chimneys out of wood because people were burning their houses down. <laughs> so uh, building code has been around for a long time. <laughs> and the important thing to remember, and as a building official, which I was for 34 years, is you can make buildings safer. But the important thing, you can't make them perfectly safer. Nobody could afford to buy them. So there are changes that come about through new technology that improve the safety of the house. And over the years, building codes have saved thousands of lives. So they're important to, to this county and they're important to anybody that wants to buy a new home in this county that you're getting a home 
It's leaf built to a certain safety level. That's what building codes do. So with that, uh, I'm, I'm in support of this bill. And I know there are a couple more amendments that uh, have been brought up, and I'd be glad to uh, talk about those and address those. Mr. Brazel. Uh, yeah, on, on this bill, um, I, I respect Mr. Hammond. He has, he's done a good job when he was the building commissioner here. and, and uh, But that back in Dave's time, I don't know if we were on international building code, maybe to the end. But um, I, I voted for international building code back in 2006, which um, back then I thought it was probably the thing to do. But I, I don't think it's a thing to do now. Um, I think it was a mistake back then, and I know it's a mistake now. And the thing is, is, is the buildings are safe. Our buildings are as safe as they can be. It's like you can over-engineer stuff, and it costs people money. <laughs> and a lot of the people who are making these decisions are the very people who are not building things, aren't doing things, and aren't, aren't getting the building permits and doesn't know how complicated the process is. Like, for instance, and Mr. Cronin and I have had, Mr. Cronin owns businesses, he does buildings, I build things, I have businesses, and, and you run into the bureaucracy of government, and they, their, their intentions are good. I'm not saying that they're ill intentions, they're not trying to be evil, they're not, and they just think that they're doing what they need to do to make it safe, which is, it's the hysteria of safe for the children, or this or that, and which is, is getting into the, it's strangling us, it's strangling our economy, it's strangling jobs, it's strangling small business, and the Home Builders Association, nobody wants this. They think they're trying, they, they, they wrote a letter, yeah, we agree with it. They agree simply because they're trying to just get it over with and be compromising on some of the changes they got. But you know, the drywall and a, I think we might have changed it. You had to have a permit if your fence was more than 24 inches tall, you know. Or if you have a, if you have a deck over 200 square feet on a 3, 312 slope, it has to have an engineer seal. Well, come on. I, I mean, I, I've been drawing decks and building houses my whole life. I can draw it up myself. Or you, uh, the no arc circuit breaker. There's a no arc circuit breaker. If anybody knows what no arc circuit breaker is, it's going to be wrote into these new codes. It, it's a $600 circuit breaker. Your circuit breakers you're putting in your house now are about 50 bucks. And my electrician came, I built the house in 2012, and it had the no arc circuit breaker on it. And this is a, a thing I didn't know that existed. And he comes out there, and he's a licensed electrician, and he pulled out the circuit breaker, and he put in the old $50 one, because the $600 ones are so sensitive that if there's one little glitch with the electronics, it's going to constantly throw the breaker. And they don't work. But that's in the new IBC code because they know what's best for you without you having an opportunity to make that decision if you want to spend $600 per 40 amps. So my point is, 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 like I said, none of these council members or perhaps in the administration don't, they, we, may, we don't agree on this one. I don't think their intentions are ill at all. Um, I just think that uh, they're getting caught up in, in, in bureaucratic uh, nonsense. Um, this is no different than Obamacare. Um, you like it or you don't like it, it, but we all know the problems that are, it's causing major chaos right now. It was similar to this, seven, 8,000 pages, nobody read it. But you know what, I'm sure we'll work it out. There's things in there, no. You know, I just don't think we need it. The building codes we have now are sufficient. And um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just, I think it's just too much government. We don't need it, it, it and you know, the president that got elected, he's repealing, like you, Cronin said, every two, you repeal two ordinances for every one you make or whatever. I mean, this is going in the opposite direction. And so I just think it's not good for, there's not one person in this county, not one constituent in this county said, you know what, I think we need a 2015 International Billing Code. I think that would be good for us. Not one person said that. This is brought to us by I don't know who. And so um, it's a bad plan, it's a bad idea. And um, I'm totally opposed to it. You good? I'm good, thank okay. you. Thank Mr. you for Cronin. Me, let me speak. I'm not gonna cut you off, man. Mr. Cronin. Um, just so you know, um, I've been working some, talking some with Mr. Hefner, not as much as I should, about making an amendment regarding the floor joists, which are the, the most expensive portion of this code. I reached out to three large builders in my district to get an idea what this would cost and get their comments on the new 15 code. I reached out to electrical contractor, a lumberyard that supplies floor joists, and we have some, some uh, amendments coming with floor joists. 
Uh, arc fault breakers, I've talked to an electrical contractor about those to get some recommendations of them. However, Dave has t told me that the existing code has those in the bedrooms, and the electrical contractor did say they're not a bad thing to have in the bedrooms. It may save somebody from, from dying from a house fire. Uh, while I've not had Dave's level of expertise with, with, with 35 years in the building industry, uh, the little bit that I do have, um, you know, the, the codes have to be simple. While I've not eight, read the 8,000 pages, I have read all 188 pages that we're, that we're planning on changing. And we've also reached out to a lot of people in my district, which is a rural district, and I heard you, Ms. Bayer, about being on 38 acres out in the country. And there are some fencing requirements that Mr. Brazel had a problem with in your district where he live, and I do too, that we're working on changing that. So this is the reason Mr. Klinghammer is wanting to table this or hold it, I think, is a good thing because he's also been working on the, the these Mike Klinghammer's been working on the, the penalty phase of it. How, what are our penalties? Uh, how are they compared to, to other places in the state and state law? So, I mean, we're not, we're not ready for this the way it is right now. I think that's clear. The other thing is, Mr. Davis, are you still in the room at all? I think you may have left. He left. Yeah. He left. Yes. I want to tell you, that gentleman that spoke up about the problems he was, we, he was having building commercial buildings in the county is probably responsible for more new jobs in this county than any single person for 40 years, Bill's been building buildings and been moving businesses in this county. Places like North Central Industrial Park in, o in O'Fallon wouldn't happen without Bill Davis. So when I hear a gentleman like that saying, this is a problem, we need to look at this a little bit, that perks my ears up quite a bit because I know that man builds buildings that creates jobs. And we've got to list them as a council, and I think I want you folks to know that we are listening. If you have specific problems with this code, you need to send us an email to it, okay? And, and, and I think the changes are all on the website site where you guys can pull them up should you want to read the 188 pages of really dry boring stuff to read okay? okay anybody else ron i would tell you you asked did we read the 8,000 pages no but we all read the 188 changes so <laughs> of the the 8,000 pages most of that is stay will stay in place if we do nothing the 2009 code stays in place so the majority of that 8,000 pages stays in place some of this stuff that we found um, looking at the 2009 code, we realized didn't make any sense because uh, the majority of us weren't here when the 2009 was passed and some of the stuff got missed, like the 24-inch fence, you have to have a permit right now for the 24-inch fence. So some of that stuff would be nice to get rid of and to fix. So there are some good things where if we don't do anything, we can't fix the stuff that we found was wrong. So we're working on doing some of those amendments right now. Yes, sir? Uh, one clarification on the ad hoc committee, we are not addressing the IBC, just so we understand that we're addressing some other older issues that we're just trying to look at. So that those are two separate items. Yeah, the gentleman in the back, I believe you brought that up. Uh, yeah, so the, the ad hoc committee is actually working on clearing up processes for the county, making it easier for you to do business with the county and making the county a little more user friendly from that standpoint. Uh, just so you know. And just so you know, in the public comments section, we generally have a policy. You can say whatever you want for three minutes and we'll respond later. We don't respond during public comments. That way we don't get back into a back and forth. You could say whatever you want. And most of you do, thank God. So uh, uh, I would move back to Mr. Klinghammer if we're all done with our no. say. Nope, Mr. Hammond. Did you want to uh, go ahead and make a motion to, to uh remove the drywall requirements for manufactured floor trusses? Yes, I think so, but I think Mr. Hefner is probably going to have to, to do the legalese on that, correct, Mr. Hefner? Well, I think the proper way to do this is right. go ahead and propose the amendment okay. and, and get it passed before he makes the changes. So that I... <laughs> Point of order from Mr. Hazelwood, please. Legal counsel in the middle. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd request a moment to confer with my attorney. Well, well <laughs> Drew Hefner is here this evening. Number one, he's the person drafting the bill. So, if you are going to make a motion to amend, you, you would have to actually this evening offer the exact language that you're proposing. Now. Drew may be able to help you out this evening. I'll defer to him on that front. But by the same token, I would, I would say to you that I think there's several other amendments that we're trying to, to incorporate into the bill, and we may be better off uh, getting a substitute bill that incorporates uh, 
all the differing inputs that we're getting, including the penalties, including the floor joices. And, Mr. Brazel, know, do you have changes as well? I think a lot of them were similar to, uh, to Joe's, and, and since Joe was working on it, um, I talked to Drew. Where's Drew? Is he here? He, he is. He's right over the corner. Yeah. Drew, or you want to stand up? I mean, Drew was really hoping to get out of here without <laughs> having to come up. I think we were waiting on, were you going to, did you drive something for Mr. Cronin? I have not. Um, that's not his fault. That's my fault. Because to be frank with you, I reached out to three builders for comments about the whole code. I wanted, I'm wanted. i very concerned about this affecting the new home building industry in this county, which is really critical to my district. So I reached out to those builders, and I've been getting the information back in pieces. So I should get that. I will push that and get that tomorrow, okay, and try to get this information for you this week. Okay. okay? And so where I am is... That I, we have the original bill. I did a substitute for Mr. Right. Klinghammer, but in talking to him, I think he wants to make some amendments to the, his substitute. That is correct. I've started working on a substitute for you, Mr. Brazel, but one of the issues I have for the question, so I wasn't able to complete that. So that's that, kind of I where we are. The, the, as everyone knows, it, it, I, I am not in favor of this at all, but I, if, if for some reason it's gonna go, and these council members know this, if it's gonna go through, I'm gonna try to get as much out of it as I can. That it's within reason and um so mr cronin and i are on the same page in a lot of items and maybe even mr hammond on some of the items um and i think it's fair to say that uh that we'll try to soften it but like i said i'm opposed to the thing altogether and, and the council my, you guys know that and i'm I, but i'm just trying to if it's going to go through i got to try to make it as soft as possible but i don't know what else to let's, do let's get it, one clean version if we can with it, amendments yeah. and and know what we're voting on we removed the provision for the requiring permits for fences i have done that as part of the substitute for mr brazel as well as a, another change okay, only in so agricultural areas all right no no there was a no the law is six foot fencing the permit for a six foot or above that has now. been changed the fencing that, has, that been, has changed. been changed yes. okay because way it currently sits is you still need a permit for a fence of 24 inches or above that has been changed and the, yes. Right, yes. but that that is part of the current building code, correct? No. The, the, yes, it is. That is in the current yes. 2009 the, code that we are under. No, it's not. It's six foot, isn't it? No. That's it's what not. we're changing the, it to. It's the, always been six foot. The one that no, has no. been in no, yeah. it is not. It's, it's currently 24 inches and above. That's why this whole argument started. John. I'm just saying we're hashing this out, and I, there was a lot of discussion that's a lot of concern about this bill, and I think we're doing the right thing by tabling it, trying to work it through, yeah. and trying to come with something that, that everybody can live with. Yeah. Can we do a last couple, and then, because we're, yep. we're going to table this anyway, Great. Yep. yep. All right. So, do we need to have more discussion on I just this? Have or? one item that I like to have for the next meeting. Okay. We have an insurance man for this county. He left early. I think it's Ed. I forgot his name. Okay. Yes. But there's been a lot of discussion about what happens to our insurance rates if we keep to the 209 versus if we adopt the 2015. I would like some 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 hard data on that. Okay. How important is it that we adopt the 15? Even if we take the 15 and modify the hell out of it. Is, is that going to help people have lower homeowner rates, or is that just a, 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 a fallacy? Fall. Well, to be I, fair, Ed is yeah. Ed is HR, so I don't I don't know how much Ed's going to no, know about no, it. Ed, Ed Ed's is insurance our risk manager in the department. Oh, okay. Yes. So he's Sorry. in charge. Of, well, he's insured. So <laughs> I mean, I know he does insurance. a lot of our insurance. So he, Dave, he does. He does I, a lot can, of health insurance, but we can find that out. We'll find that out. I can answer that question. I think a lady sure. out here who spoke earlier was explaining that what the ISO rating for this county is set on, and she is absolutely correct. Everything she said, if we maintain an ISO rating of three, I'm sorry, of 10, nine, or eight, or down to a seven, if you maintain that ISO rating, the insurance industry would grant and it's up to the insurance broker, she's correct, that would save you 5% on your storm. It would save you, this is what I've been told, and, and I've sat through meetings on this over and over, 
they can grant you up to 5% savings on your wind insurance to, for wind damage to your house. They don't have to grant that. That's correct. You said that. They don't have to grant that. They don't have to grant ISO ratings for anything if they don't want to. Final word, Mr. Brazzard. Final word, thank you. Um, I, I have one question. The only thing that hinges on the reasons we need to do this is all this ISO, this insurance fallacy. So is the council saying that it, if it cannot be proven that there's a true savings that you guys aren't going to support it? No. 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 Right. That's, that's not then what Then there's the no point saying. even... I mean, we could disprove it or prove it. So, I mean, if, if Joe wants to have it proven, I can have someone come in and disprove it, too. So, I don't That's why I was just asking if we're hanging our hat on that. That's what I wanted to know. I don't believe we are. I, I think, All right. I think Back to Mr. Small, I think it's a very small factor. I think there's a lot of other big issues besides the insurance. Well, I think we all agreed when we started going through it, there's stuff that we found in the code that we went, this shouldn't be there. Yes. So, that's part of the reason. And, fixing some of this stuff. And Mr. Chairman, do you have any more questions for me? <laughs> no, thank you for your time. Uh, Mr. You. Klinghammer. You thank you. A motion to hold. Mr. Klinghammer has a motion to hold this bill. And I will second it. Mr. Hollander has a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, the building is held. Oof. Let's move on to bill number 4476. God willing, this will go faster than the last one. Substitute bill number 4476, an ordinance authorizing two agreements between St. Charles County and the City of St. Peter's relating to St. Charles County's Urban County Community Development Block Grant CDBG program, including one, a 2017 professional administrative services agreement, and two, a 2017 agreement for administering urban county programs through May 31st, 2017. Any questions or comments on 4476? Seeing none. An ordinance authorizing two agreements between St. Charles County and the City of St. Peter's relating to St. Charles County's Urban Co County Community Development Block Grant CDBG program, including one, a 2017 professional administrative services agreement, and two, a 2017 agreement for administering urban county programs through May 31st, 2017. Councilmember Brazel? Uh, yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Klinghammer? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Bill number 4476 passes on to bill number 4477. Bill number 4477, an ordinance authorizing four agreements between St. Charles County and the City of St. Charles relating to St. Charles County's urban county community development block grant CDBG program, including one, a cooperation agreement for the city of St. Charles to join the urban county, two, a 2017 professional administrative services agreement, three, a 2018 professional administrative services agreement, and four, a 2017 agreement for administering urban county programs. Any questions or comments on 4477? Seeing none. An ordinance authorizing four agreements between St. Charles County and the City of St. Charles relating to St. Charles County's Urban County Community Development Block Grant CDBG program, including one, a cooperation <coughs> agreement for the City of St. Charles to join the Urban County, two, a 2017 professional administrative services agreement, three, a 2018 professional administrative services agreement, and four, a 2017 agreement for administering urban county programs. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Klinghammer? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? Yes. Bill number 4477 passes on to our final bills for final passage, 4478. Bill number 4478, an ordinance approving execution of supplemental cost share agreement number one to an intergovernmental agreement with the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission and the City of Wentzville for improvements on US 61 between Route A and Piney Road. Any questions or comments on 4478? I don't know. Not all Gentlemen? No? Seeing none. An ordinance approving execution of supplemental cost share agreement number one to an intergovernmental agreement with the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission and the City of Wentzville for improvements on US 61 between Route A and Piney Road. Councilmember Elam? Yes. Councilmember Hollander? Yes. Councilmember Klinghammer? Yes. Councilmember White? Yes. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Councilmember Brazel? Abstain. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Bill number 4478 passes. That's it for bills for final passage. I just have one question. Yes, sir. 
Does this uh, does this include the overpass at Flint Hill? Yes. 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 Yes, uh, yes this is the uh, overpass and interchange at between uh, PM Piney at Flint Hill. Thank goodness this is finally coming to fruition. There you go. Uh, on to bills for introduction. We only have two. Bill number 4480. Bill number 4480, request by Joe Cronin, sponsored by Council as a whole, an ordinance amending section 405.060 and section 405.080.C of the ordinances of St. Charles County, Missouri, OSCCMO, to authorize certain meeting facilities as well as rural recreational activity as conditional uses in the A Agricultural Zoning District. Mr. Cronin. Uh, Ed, would you come forward, please? Um, this gentleman uh, has a, a pumpkin patch that's been operating for a long time with a lot of activities for kids and families. And uh, as, as the current trend is, a lot of people want to get married outside. And uh, unbeknownst to him that he would he needed special permitting to get um, to get um, have merit or weddings there. He's worked with the uh, Wentzville Fire Protection to get his place up to what he needs to be to, for their protection. Uh, Robert and, um, and Mike have worked really good with community development to work with him to figure out what he needs to do. And essentially, this is a change in the in the in the um, the code that would allow weddings. Uh, and rural rec recreational activities uh, to, to happen in areas of the county, but subject to conditional use permits. So the, just so you know, once we pass this, doesn't mean you've got the permit. It means you have to go through the process of applying for the permit. Your neighbors will be notified. They'll come up if they have concerns about particular things. For instance, like maybe no loud music after midnight, et cetera, that could be conditions. So I, I think by doing it this way, we strike a happy balance between the right of this gentleman and his wife to try to make a living in a rural area supporting his family and also protecting the neighbors for the activities that he may have. And uh, I think um, Robert Myers did a fine job with this and Mike Herbert did meeting with this gentleman trying to work out details that both the citizens of this county protected and uh, still also uh, allow him to, to c carry on his business. And other than that, you know, you can add whatever you'd like at this time. Uh, okay. I have a copy of my conditional use permit application right here, and um, <laughs> I would like to also thank, uh, before I thank them, my old job was working directly with uh, the government, and as many people have said, it can be very difficult working with the government. Uh, a lot of things that are hard to understand, and uh, people do, they do things that, that just doesn't make sense sometimes, but my experience with, uh, with both Jared, is it Aggie? AG, and as well as Robert Myers, has been just a real pleasure. They uh, have answered every question and worked with me and are helping me out significantly. And also thanks to you for sponsoring this bill as well. Yeah. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? We're working on fixing that process so it's not easy to work with us anymore. <laughs> oh, okay, good. We've got an ad hoc committee that's can on that right now. Can you wait a couple months until this is done? <laughs> that's right. All we'll right. see what we can do. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, thank you for coming in. Good luck. It's Charlie Brown marriages. That's going to be fun. It's a great pumpkin. I can't wait for that one. All right, so bill number 4481. Bill number 4481, request by Hope Woodson, sponsored by Mike Elam. An ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute an intergovernmental agreement for financial assistance grant agreement number 2017006 between St. Charles County and the St. Louis Jefferson Solid Waste Management District for receipt of funds in an up amount of up to $55,000 and amending the 2017 budget adopted by ordinance 16-104 by appropriating additional funds in the general fund budget Department of Public Health. Any questions or comments on this bill? Seeing none, we move on to announcements and miscellaneous. Anything for the good or the order? Well, I got something. We had our catfish tournament uh, the, for Focus Marines and Defiance over the uh, Memorial Day weekend, so we raised money for the wounded veterans, and uh, we had caught uh, over 1,200. There was 14 teams. They caught 1,200 pounds of fish. Uh, on uh, we went out Friday night, set their lines, and came in on Saturday. We had uh, first place wild shoots. Uh, their their fish was uh, almost 49 pounds, one catfish, 
and the three biggest were the total was 88.9 pounds, and then second place was a 44 pound catfish. These are huge fish. I mean, this these is like hillbilly foot. hand fishing that they're doing or something. <laughs> not, it's hillbilly, but not hand fishing. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's line fishing. It's all fun though. So, and we raised money for the veterans, and so it turned out really good. That was our second annual Memorial Day uh, catfish tournament. Very good. Anything else? Entertain a motion to dismiss. Motion. Moved. Motion moved and second. All those in favor? Aye. We are dismissed.